welcome everyone uh, to the second of a series of webinars uh, as part of the SDG uh, 4 data webinar series. Um, we have a lot to lot to talk about uh, this morning and afternoon, um, so let's get, get right to it. Um, this webinar series is in the context of the uh, recent release of laying the foundation to measure sustainable development goal 4 and the UNESCO E-Atlas for Education 2030 and also kind of in the run-up to the UN General Assembly where there will be again a discussion of the indicator frameworks related to the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, this webinar will last one hour um, and I'll start by um, saying something about the uh, introducing the speakers uh, and the structure for the, the webinar. So uh, we're very happy to have as our, our presenter for today um, Dr. Marguerite Clark from the World Bank. Um, she's a senior education specialist in the education global practice at the World Bank and she's the manager of the Reed Trust Fund program which I think many of you are familiar with. Since 2007 she's led the bank's work on learning and educational assessment systems. In addition to assisting individual bank, bank, bank client countries to improve their assessment systems. Um, she's also been uh, really instrumental in leading the development of evidence-based tools and approaches for evaluating and strengthening the quality of learning standards and assessment systems in general. Um, so uh, Marguerite will speak for 15 to 20 minutes um, and present a number of important issues related to uh, the SDGs and the, the way forward in terms of measurement. Uh, and then we'll have three uh, discussions. Um, and we've invited discussants representing different um, perspectives, um, both from uh, uh, civil society and community monitoring, uh, as well as from regional assessment that, that takes place in Africa, uh, as well as a national um, uh, a coordinator of, of uh, assessment work uh, in Mexico. Uh, and these are, I, I'll briefly uh, introduce each of the discussants. Um, we, first of all, um, Dr. Bella Jamil, who is a public policy specialist, and she leads the citizen led assessment and accountability initiative, uh, ACER, A S E R, in Pakistan. Um, it's a member of the People's Action for Learning Network, a South South initiative across 13 countries. And she's worked extensively with provincial and federal governments as a technical advisor in education sector reform, public-private partnerships, innovations, and financing. And she's currently serving as the commissioner to the International Commission on Ed Financing Global Education Opportunity, otherwise known as the Education Commission. Following um, Bella, we'll have Jacques Maltel, um, who is the coordinator for the PASEC, the Programme d'Analyse de Système Educatif de la Contemaine, uh, which is working in a number of uh, Central and West African countries um, uh, in, in, in actually uh, implementing um, student assessment. Uh, the CONFEMEN is the Conference of Education Ministers of States and Governments of the Francophonie. Uh, he was also a program director for a French NGO which specialized in education in Senegal and Niger. Uh, he was an education specialist in the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs and at the European Commission before joining the CONFEMEN. And then finally, we'll hear from Andre Sanchez, who works at the National Institute for Education Evaluation in Mexico as the General Director of Education Results. So he's involved in assessment, both national and international programs. He was the head of the Planning and Evaluation Unit in the National Autonomous University of Mexico, uh, professor of psychology, uh, member of the technical councils, and he's participated in the Interagency Advisory Science Council for the Public Education Ministry. So I think we've got a really excellent panel here. Um, so let's let's go ahead and, and move on to the to the discussion. I just wanted to to say something about the, um, the how, how this webinar works in terms of the ability to pose questions to the uh, panelists. Um, so it's using the Q and A or the chat um, buttons. You can submit a question to the presenters or the line of discussants. Please use the box on your screen at at any time. Um, and then depending on the volume of questions, we'll, um, we'll have to see how we can try to group some of the questions and try to make sure that we get a good, uh, good representative um, selection of, of the questions if it's not possible to answer every, every one. And we have quite a large group um, registered for the uh, webinar, um, but please uh, feel free to um, pose your questions. The webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the UIS website uh, in the near future. Um, so there will be an opportunity to share this more widely with your colleagues who weren't able to register. So let's turn now to the 
to the presentation and to, to Marguerite Clark for uh, the presentation on, on towards a workable strategy to measure learning. Marguerite? Okay, thank you very much, Albert, and thank you to everyone who is joining us for today's webinar. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are. I'm going to take you through um, um, just a brief overview of some of the challenges that seem to be ahead of us as we try to move from having agreed on indicators for, for tracking learning under the new SDGs to actually having a strategy that, that's going to allow us to, to implement uh, approaches to measuring those indicators. So as you can see, this is the second in a four-part webinar series. I'm going to focus in particular on um, strategies for measuring learning. Next week, you're going to hear more about early childhood development. Uh, indicators, and then the last session is going to look at the equity aspect of of monitoring learning. So let's start. Um, I have 15 to 20 minutes, so there's so much to cover in this area that you could talk for far longer than 20 minutes on this. I'm going to focus in on four main aspects um, to help us start thinking about what does it mean to create a workable strategy to measure learning. First, I'd like us to think about what are the areas of learning that are considered globally relevant under the existing SDGs. Um, and then we're going to look at to what extent countries are already measuring in those areas. What are some of the challenges associated with taking what countries are already doing and bringing it up to a level that's going to allow us to do global reporting. And then finally, we're going to look at some of the strategies that are already being proposed to address these challenges, but I'm sure some of those online may have other strategies to propose. So what are the areas that are considered globally relevant? Well, under the SDGs, Goal 4 really encapsulates the essence of the kind of learning that we're thinking about um, for the next 15 years. The emphasis is on inclusive, equitable quality education. So it's education for all and lifelong learning for all. Um, learning is something that happens both inside and outside of school and for the duration of your lifetime. It's a very broad, encompassing vision. Um, I think that the right one for, for where the world is at and where we want to go. So under goal four, let's take a look. Let's unpack it. Under goal four, there are actually seven targets. But the first one is the one that really focuses in on learning outcomes in primary and secondary education. It's giving us a 15-year window, and it's saying by 2030, our target is we want all girls and boys to complete free, equitable, quality education. Um, and then it has that very tantalizing phrase, that education that leads to relevant and effective learning outcomes. So what do we mean by that? That's really captured by um, the indicators. So for this target, um, 4.1, as I said, it's one of seven targets, there is uh, one main indicator. And, and this indicator asks countries to track the proportion of their children and young people at three points in primary and secondary education. Um, the proportion of children in grades two or three, at the end of primary, and at the end of lower secondary, who are achieving at least minimum proficiency in reading and math by sex. So as you can see, that indicator has a lot in it. There's six uh, key data points there, further disaggregated by gender. But that, at the end of the day, that's what's going to be tracked globally. Now, in the lead-in to um, the SDGs, there was a lot of conversation under the Learning Metrics Task Force about a huge wide panoply of areas in learning that are important. But at the end of the day, it's boiled down to reading and math in terms of the areas that are core to the other learning areas and which are to some degree trackable at a global level. To what extent are countries already measuring these areas? Well, this table is actually from a report that UIS recently put out. It's called Laying the Foundation to Measure Sustainable Development Goal 4. 
and you'll find it on their website. And what you see here basically is taking that indicator, 4.1.1, and breaking out by reading and by math at those three stages of schooling, grade two or three, end of primary, end of lower secondary, looking at four key regions to see what percent of countries in those regions actually are already measuring those areas. Um, you'll see I've got a red circle around two numbers. This is the percentage for countries that the highest percentage of of data available is for grades two or three reading in Latin America and the Caribbean and Sub-Saharan Africa. So 80 to 81 percent represents the highest percent of countries that already are measuring in that area. Everything else in this table is lower than that. Um, as a region, Latin America and the Caribbean seems to be best set. They already have quite a lot of data for grades two, three, end of primary and end of lower secondary for reading and math. The region that seems to have the furthest to go is Asia and the Pacific. They seem to have be doing less in these areas than some of the other regions. So what are some of the technical and political challenges that are going to be facing those countries and others as we try to go from the current state of affairs, the way that countries are or are not measuring reading and math at those three points, to something that will actually allow us to do some global reporting in those areas um, for the SDGs. Um, there are lots of different challenges. I've just picked out four here. I'm sure our discussants will have more to add. Um, the first one is how do you report data from all of these different assessments at a global level? So how do you take all of these apples, oranges, and bananas and try and make them into one meaningful set of data at a global level. Let's tackle that one first. Um, what you see here is um, a map from a report that we commissioned uh, in the last year that looked at the history of country participation in international and regional assessments over time, since 1965. And the darker the color, the more experience that country has in the area of international or regional assessment. So I'm showing you this because regional and international assessments give us some kind of foundation or basis for starting to compare in a way that might ultimately let us come up with a global picture of learning. So this does not reflect national assessments, but it looks at assessments where there is some effort to compare within a region or, or internationally. And you can see that it's um, the Americas, uh, Russia, and Europe that have the greatest density of, of color, which means they've been doing more in this area. So you can see that Africa and Asia, the, the lighter colors mean that they have less of a legacy in generating data on reading a map that's actually comparable. So, so that's something to keep in mind as we plan for technical capacity building and funding. And even for those assessments that already exist, that are trying to make some effort at being comparative, at being somewhat globally, uh, global in their nature, um, what you see here, I'll go to these quickly, um, I've chunked the three main international assessments, PISA, TIMS, and PEARLS at the top of the table, and then I have the three main regional assessments underneath, uh, SA for Latin America, SACMIC for uh, Southern Africa, and PASIC for Western Francophone Africa. You can see that the international assessments cover a lot of countries um, and have a more regular frequency. Um, and then the regional assessments are still a little bit more sporadic, but I know recently there have been efforts to stabilize them. And a stable fixed schedule of data collection is going to be important if we want to consistently track uh, learning levels and reading and math over time. You can see here quickly these assessments, these three international and three regional, also differ in content and format. Um, most of them are curriculum-based, PISA's not, um, most of them um, assess both reading and math, but um, the TIMS and PEARLS assessments are, are TIMS measures math and science, PEARLS measures reading, 
So there's variety. There's some commonality, but there's variety. And again, in how they analyze and report the data, um, the international assessments have a strong legacy of using item response theory, different models. The regional assessments um, have been, are also using IRT, but not quite to the same um, level, but they're, they're getting there. And you can see that they have different levels of proficiency. So they categorize student scores in different ways in terms of how proficient those scores suggest the student is in terms of reading them out. So bottom line, yes, there are some assessments that are trying to make these comparisons, but even those assessments differ among themselves. So we have a challenge ahead of us. And one of the solutions that's being proposed currently is um, this idea of trying to take all of those assessments. Um, you can see here we have four fictional assessments, A, B, C, D, and trying to put them on a universal scale that represents a universal conception of reading proficiency or math proficiency and that goes as you go from lower to higher on the scale it goes from lower levels of proficiency to higher so trying to find a way to allow for each of these existing assessments to continue to exist but try to find a way to allow for the data or results from them to be mapped onto this so-called universal scale and obviously that that's a technical challenge but I think it's a, a, it's a challenge worth taking on um, okay, this is the second of the four challenges that I outlined. Um, this is how do we define minimum proficiency? Because remember, the indicator is asking countries to look at what is the percent or proportion of your students who are reaching at least minimum level of proficiency in reading and math at each of those three key stages in schooling. And, and this is not an easy task. It's, it's as much political as it is technical. And just to show how messy it can be, I've taken this image from a report that juxtaposes the um, level of proficiency required for the United States National Assessment of Educational Progress with where states were setting the cut scores for proficiency on their own tests. And I've also included where the U.S. National Assessment basic cut score was. So the vertical lines are the National Assessment cut scores for basic and then proficient. The states are the little dots and vertical lines moving up as you go from left to right. And you can see there's a huge variation between the national definition for what proficient in reading looks like and how states were setting it. Those are some of the issues that are going to need to be resolved uh, across countries and, and different assessments if we want to have a meaningful way of tracking minimum proficiency at a global level. And the next issue, um, the third challenge I'd like to point out is what kind of progress should we expect? Um, if we are tracking the percent of students who are reaching minimum proficiency between now and 2030, how much progress should we expect? What should normal progress look like? What would below par performance look like? If you look at trends on the three international assessments that are already out there, the trends in international math and science study, the progress in international reading literacy, and the program for international student assessment, you see certain trends emerging over time when you look at how countries perform on these system level comparative uh, monitoring tools. You see generally more progress happens over time at the primary level. You're more likely to see scores going up at the primary level, particularly in math. Conversely, you're less likely to see scores going up as students get older, uh, particularly in reading. What you also see is that countries can make big gains regardless of where they start from. Um, you see Brazil has made big gains over the last um, 15 or so years um, as much as, say, Korea has made gains, and they're at different ends of the performance scale. Um, the third point is that while some countries see very large increases, and often this is tied to, to significant education reforms in the country, most countries see very small changes in the order of maybe a one to two percentage point increase in the percentage of students who are reaching the minimum proficiency level or above on these tests. 
So that would mean if you had a country that had 50% of students proficient in reading in, in grade two or three now, that you might expect 65% of students to have reached that level by 2030. So you can see that you know, it could be more than that, but the average is for small incremental change over time. And the two images I have here at the bottom are for, for Russia. These show additional wrinkles in how you measure progress. Um, on the left, you see these are Russia's scores on the International Reading Literacy Test. Their grade four reading scores have been increasing over time, but so too has the gender gap. So girls is the upper line, boys is the lower. Scores are improving both, but there's a bigger gap emerging that is actually statistically significant. Um, so how do we factor that in? On the right-hand side, you see the grade eight math scores over time for Russia on TIMS, the trend in international mathematics and science study. And you can see the general trend is upwards, but there's um, a lot of up and down movement. So again, countries might dip one year or two and then go up. So learning how to to un interpret changes in scores over time and, and uh, how do you manage when there's a drop one year but it goes up the next. Okay, and then the last point I wanted to raise was what about countries that don't have assessments at all or that don't have very strong assessments? And, and what you see here in this chart is some data from a tool we have at the World Bank uh, it's called Sabre Student Assessment, where um, this is data for 34 countries where we looked at the quality of their assessment systems. So there's four groupings here. We looked at the quality of their classroom assessment, their examinations, their national large scale, and their international large scale. And the, the light bar, you can see the red bar is latent, the very kind of light green bar is emerging. That shows weaker levels of, of quality in those aspects of their systems. And you can see that for national and international, a lot of countries are still in the early stages of putting in place robust large-scale systems. So they're going to need support to create stronger systems. And what are some of the proposed strategies that are already on the table for addressing these kind of issues? Well, I've got three things here. Um, there are new global assessments being offered by uh, several of the international assessment agencies, and these are designed to be more relevant for, for developing or lower income, lower performing countries. So um, the TIMS and PEARLS assessments are now supplemented by assessments that focus in particular on numeracy and literacy. Uh, PISA has a new initiative called PISA for Development, and they're all meant to flesh out the lower end of the achievement scale and actually um, allow countries to capture data on learning and also correlates of achievement that are more relevant. The second of the proposed strategies is new global technical partnerships like the Global Alliance to Monitor Learning that's meant to bring people together from around the world to look at these kind of challenges, improve coordination and reach some kind of consensus on what's good enough, you know, what, what does technical quality look like in a large-scale assessment. And then the final one, uh, and very important, is trying to come up with global funding options to help support the work that countries and others are going to need to do in these areas. Um, so that's it for this one, and those are the next two webinars here that you can see where you can continue the conversation um, on early childhood development and equity. Um, but for the moment, um, I'm going to finish with my contribution to um, this session on a workable strategy to measure learning, and I'll hand it over to Albert um, and the discussants. So thank you very much. Great. Thank, thank you very much, Marguerite. I think, uh, I think you very succinctly and very clearly set out some of these major challenges, the key challenges around the operationalization or the implementation of, you know, how do we go from then an indicator to to actually making it um, making it uh, robust and working well to to capture progress. Um, so now let's turn to uh, to our panel to to engage in this set of key challenges or perhaps also to add new challenges to this list that need to be considered. Um, and we'll start with um, with uh, Bella Jamil for. Uh, each of the discussions will have five minutes, and then we'll come back um, to, to your questions at the end of the webinar. So now to, to Bella, please. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, um, Marguerite, um, and thank you very much the UNESCO Institute of Statistics for bringing us um, on board a very important topic. Um, I wanted to thank Marguerite for uh, laying out the entire landscape so uh, uh, beautifully with all the nuances in terms of the challenges. Since I'm representing the citizen-led learning assessments, I did sort of find in your in the presentation um, uh, an absence of reference uh, to the citizen-led assessments, which have been part of a citizen-led accountability and learning um, social movement. Um, these, this is. Uh, I just wanted to share uh, with the audience that the citizen-led assessments um, have been recognised for uh, influencing uh, the SDG 4 and, in particular, 4.1. Not only in terms of the framing of the uh, of the goal uh, and the target of 4.1, but also in the debate on the indicators and particularly getting the lower primary indicator in place. Um, uh, lots of us have been working towards it and got the lower primary indicator there as shared by Marguerite earlier. Um, our experience has been, so we are nine countries already doing it in Latin America, Africa, and South Asia, and another uh, five have joined hands. So this is a growing South South initiative on uh, looking at oral assessments. Um, there, our concern is that in this uh, whole uh, discussion of finding a common parameter for what is relevant and effective learning outcomes is no small task, as even highlighted by uh, Marguerite. But um, it is very important to see a role for, and what was not really debated and discussed, was also the costs of these assessments. Uh, Marguerite did point out that there will be some, there is likely to be some funding for this um, by GPE and perhaps even others, but the costs of these comparable assessments or and international assessments are quite substantive. And if you remember that we saw in the uh, in that global map that a lot, and as indicated, that a lot of the low-income countries are still out of the radar, so to speak, on assessments. So uh, we have countries which are not in, uh, engaged in even national, what to speak of, international uh, large-scale assessments, and therefore get left out. In the challenges that come in front of us, and of course in the uh, big conversations that have gone on and continue to inform us, is the whole issue of not that children are in schools, but are they learning? And the learning crisis seems to have even gotten bigger than the 250 million children in school and not learning. The recent reports show even larger numbers. Um, our concern as uh, uh, the citizen-led group, which is under the umbrella now of the People's Action for Learning Network with its secretariat in Nairobi, the, our concern is that how will we find those common metrics? Um, how will we agree, as Margaret also said, on you know what will be seen as relevant and effective for everyone? One that it will be a global learning metric agreed by everyone. Uh, we are, of course, extremely uh, Uh, we are starting early in the SDG era up till 2030, and we hope to be able to come to some kind of um, conclusive um, space in which we can take things forward. But I think it is important to look at again from our perspective uh, how the citizen movement, which have already influenced SDG 4 and 4.1, how they can be also taken into account, especially in countries where it's um, where uh, the assessment regimes are not 
that uh, sophisticated or have had um, a, a, a history where uh, or to build upon. And I'm sorry, Belly. We lost your voice. Can you hear me? Bella, can you hear us? Can you can you hear me now? Yes. 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 So just. Uh, uh, wanting to take on three or four critical areas beyond this is also the issue of reporting say these reporting cycles are not fixed or they come long and then the question is much as we would all like is a universal indicator really an option? How will we get the buy-in from the countries where the ground realities differ in terms of learning levels, curricula, languages? I mean, there are countries with over 400 languages, democracy, uh, democracy as well as governance structures and national goals. These are some of our concerns that we feel that we need to be able to put out there as we go about actively exploring um, about how we will take things forward. Not to forget the role of, of course, the national assessments and their frequency, but also programmatic assessments and how does this measurement feed back into the policy uh, process. Um, and, you know, the whole business, the way we have worked on the theory of change in the uh, PAL network is you know, as, as citizens, we've gone on for collecting evidence for on the learning levels of children, basically at grades lower primary, at two and three, uh, gone on to communicate the findings, mobilize the communities for accountability and action, advocate for government action to improve learning, and reset the education agenda to focus on learning. As citizens, of course, we always bite uh, a lot more than people think we can chew. And that is, you know, how does assessment eventually lead to the action that is needed? Um, I felt it was important to share with everyone this entire perspective uh, where we are coming from. And we are not really a fringe phenomena. We are quoted not just in national um, economic surveys and um, uh, important uh, uh, documents that emerge on assessment and uh, human resources development in our countries, but also are now a regular feature of the Global Education Monitoring Report. Chapter 10 in the Global Education Monitoring Report, which was just released, I think is worth looking at. It lays down the landscape even more graphically with lots of options, including the new UNICEF mix option as well, which is emerging in this area. So I think we need to widen this conversation a little bit more uh, beyond what is seen as official sometimes and international, perhaps more expensive, perhaps not without citizens, and where citizens certainly in the past 10 years have made a dent, I would love to see that we remain uh, centered in this conversation and certainly in the solutions that we are trying to uh, come up with. Uh, I want to stop here, um, but you know, this has been very exciting as I'm going to be soon joining um, uh, my team at the UN, uh, UN uh, General Assembly on, on the 18th uh, with the Education Commission's report, which centers again on learning in a very big way. Okay, good. Thank you very much. I, th uh, I think you brought uh, some new issues uh, as well to, and important challenges to, to the list. Now let's turn to the uh, to, to Jacques Malpal, the, the head of the, the PASEC uh, Regional Assessment in Africa. Please, uh, Jacques. Okay, thank you very much uh, to the UIS who have organized this uh, webinar, and uh, thank you, Margaret, for this excellent. Uh, presentation which gives us a global picture of the situation for, for assessments. Uh, the concern is the uh, conference of the ministers of education of the country, including 44 members, uh, as uh, from, from the north, Canada, Belgium, France, or Switzerland, but also many of the countries are in, uh, in Africa. 
and some are in Asia, like Laos and Vietnam. Pastec has been established in 1991, and uh, since uh, uh, 2014, has done more than 30. The assessment in, in about uh, 20 or 21 countries uh, in, among the, the continent countries. The, the first international assessment was uh, started in uh, 2014, and we released the international report last week in Dakar in December uh, 2015. And it was the first uh, experience for us to have. Uh, international comparison between 10 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, on the results uh, in primary education at the second and, uh, and uh, the, the last grade of, of, the, of the primary. And uh, we are now in the process of releasing the national reports in each country. So the, the, the package of the PASEC is, is composed of an international report and the national report for, for each country. The, 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 the main challenges we, we, we are observing at this, uh, this uh, first international report uh, is that, uh, first of all, the, the situation is, is quite worrisome and uh, sometimes dramatic in some countries. I mean, globally, uh, at the second grade, 90% uh, of the students, the kids, are below the sufficient threshold for competencies in, in language, and 50% are below this threshold in, in mathematics. And at the sixth grade, 60% in learning and, and math are below the threshold. I mean, learning because it is not only in French. In some countries, the assessment has been produced in the, the local language, such uh, it was in, uh, in Burundi, for instance, that we did the assessment at the, the second grade in, in Kirundi. So this is the first, uh, the first uh, observation from the, from the international report of the, of the PASEC, and we see that there is, in some countries, not in all the countries, uh, quite a, a big gap between the results of the next national examination and the, the results of the, the assessment uh, uh, done, done, done by the PASEC. The, the results of the national, at the national level, will bring us more, more information on how uh, is done the distribution uh, throughout the countries in the, in the different regions. And we see quite uh, important uh, differences of performance uh, between the regions, and of course, in in some uh, in some remote regions, we have much lower results than in the capital cities. Uh, an important challenge coming from coming from from the the, the assessment, the PASEC uh, 2014 assessment, is also the the importance of the number of students reaching the last grade of primary without having the sufficient level for continuing their, their, their studies in, in uh, the schooling and in, uh, in the lower secondary. In, in, uh, globally, it's more than 60% more than, uh, uh, that haven't reached that, uh, that level, and meaning that the universal uh, education for all uh, for nine years as it is, you know, an engagement from, from the country, it will be uh, hard to reach. And worse of that, uh, in some countries, we have an important ratio of students reaching the last grade of the primary uh, without having any, any below, we are at the level below one, meaning that they are scaredy illiterate. So the question is how those students could reach the, the, the level uh, grade six with that level. So that, that puts an important challenge to the, to the national education systems and the performance, how the performance is monitored throughout the, the, the scholarship of the, of the students. So this is a very important point, and I heard what Bela Jamil said 
before on the, the cost of the of the of the those assessment. Of course, assessment is costly, but I mean the results that show uh, in, in the assessment is that you know sometimes the performance of the education system is really not what is expected. Uh, another point is also what what will be the future of those those students having very low uh, competencies at the end of primary. Of course, they are not ready to reach the lower secondary. But if they drop out of school, what will they become? What will be their future? Will they become illiterate again after you know being uh, confronted to to illiterate environment? So that's that's a, a challenge for the country and for this, this important population, uh, which is, as I say, uh, more than half of the of the population in school. Uh, and the, the last challenge is uh, that you know the results of those assessments should really be shared, and of course they should be shared with civil society because they are in the center of the of the, the, the all the education processes. Uh, so, and uh, what what is uh, what are the priorities of the education system? What should be done to improve to improve the results and to make sure that the children uh, being at the primary school really uh, can, can learn the minimum that they are supposed to know in in learning. It's only on two topics: learning and maths. But uh, everybody knows that those points are crucial uh, for the rest of any type of uh, of uh, learning and, and, and education. So we are now preparing the next round for the, the internal uh, assessment, which will happen in 2019. And we are thinking for the moment on having around 15 countries participating. In, in the process, most of them have been uh, you know, in uh, in Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. This, these are the, the the main points that we we would like to share. Of course, we are working with the, with the the, the SACMEC program, which is the program working in in southern and eastern Africa, doing more or less the, the same type of assessment. So we can we can share the, the results. We share can we can share the, the process. And have a sort of uh, Africa uh, tool for uh, measuring uh, competencies uh, as uh, as a primary primary level. So these are the the main uh, the main point, and I think that the, all the initiatives are taken by the international community on improving assessment in order to improve the quality of systems. Of course, we are in striving in in that. Uh, in that line, and uh, after we with all the of uh, our uh, tools and instruments, and uh, we are also 100% uh, ready to have this sort of international scale to compare the students. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Jacques. Uh, I think you raised some some useful points, um, and particularly from a perspective of of someone who's working with assessment on the ground uh, in, in Africa, as noted already, one of the regions where, um, where we find less, um, uh, less strong systems of, uh, of assessment or, or national assessment uh, going on. So that's very useful. Now let's turn to the, to the, to the last uh, discussant, and then we'll turn back to the uh, presenter, to Margaret Clark, for, for a few additional comments, and then we have some questions that have been uh, already submitted. Uh, if you'd like to get in a question, um, please please try to do it now so that we can we can include it in in the end. But now let's turn to to a national perspective um, and Dr. Andres Sanchez uh, from Mexico. Please. Thank you very much and hi to everyone. Um, well, um, I'm going to concentrate in some technical issues because it's my uh, matter, my my occupation, uh, and. I want to say that uh, in Mexico we use uh, some national assessment, some international. Uh, we use PISA, we use 
the assessments of Jesse. Um, and with the actual state of that international assessment, uh, compared with uh, national assessments in, in my country, uh, I think they don't share exactly the same constructs. Mm. Um, as an example, Jesse tests are about the shared um, thing, um, the shared uh, topics in in Latin America uh, countries, and this test, you know, is is not about uh, shared shared contents in in curricula. It's, it's more like um, um, competencies for for life, no? Mm, then they evaluate close but not identical constructs. So maybe the different um, agencies that work on those assessments and the other assessments can make an effort to uh, align their uh, scales or, or maybe to construct a new one uh, to have an an, a universal scale, like Marguerite uh, says us, mm, maybe there are some alternatives to a universal scale that can be uh, interesting to consider. For example, um, will we try to be explicit in a few cross-culturally relevant learning contents for assessment purposes and try to share ways to evaluate them and then use them as shared indicators, mm, not uh, uh, complete scales, but mm, a kind of uh, minimal shared um, learning contents. Or I think that we can try to put them in countries' curricula uh, before trying to evaluate them, uh, try to make a um, uh, international um, movement that tries to put in the mind of everybody that some contents, some learning contents are so important that every country must um, teach them to, to their uh, people, uh, children or adults, and then, so then, try to uh, assess them that's that's an idea. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to go back with another thing. Um, when we see that the indicator, um, I think is 4.11, says uh, by 2030, ensure all girls and boys complete freely equitable quality primary and secondary education leading to relevant and effective learning outcomes. In countries like mine, I think it's um, it's not only about learning outcomes because um, this goal has uh, uh, four issues that are important to, to consider. The the first one is that all girls and boys. It's um, it's a, a thing. It's a theme in in my, in my country and in other countries in Latin America because uh, we don't have universal access to school. Uh, maybe in primary school that it's more or less uh, well going, but not in, in the other levels. And the thing about quality of education, uh, it's, it's an important one that uh, not only uh, relates with relevant learning outcomes. I think uh, we must see uh, things about um, educational offer, uh, the conditions in in, in what uh, the education goes, especially in formal education. And think about equitable. Uh, it's an important issue in, in many countries in, in my region, in Latin America, because um, the sex uh, equity is important, but almost important or more important in some cases is 
uh, equity uh, in, in uh, I'm sorry, my internet is off now. I, I, between um, cross ethnical education, okay? And cross, cross ethnical groups. Um, so there are four uh, th topics that we need to see when we talk about the think about relevant and effective learning outcomes. Well, that's, it, there's a, a fifth one uh, that the learnings must be relevant and effective you know, for citizenship. Um, and I think there is a lot of work that we must do with our curricula to let it happen. Now, um, I want to talk to some quick um, topics now. Uh, uh, maybe we must think about uh, contents, contents related to another area like science or ethics. I, I know you are thinking about it because the documents we were, we were uh, studying says a lot about it. But maybe we think about some contents of science or ethics that can be transversal and uh, we can uh, assess them in the language or mathematics uh, um, tests, maybe we can uh, use some context, uh, ethical context or um, 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 environment content to use in some questions and tests. Well, another, another topic. Mm, countries with more advanced scores at the beginning have it more difficult to improve the, that countries with low scores. Um, it's it's uh, something interesting that when you are closer to light speed, you need so much more energy to uh, accelerate. So we must think that uh, it's not possible to all countries to develop scores in the same uh, velocity. Well, almost, almost there, okay? Maybe we don't need to define or report minimal proficiency, uh, but we can have a detailed descriptor and let every country to determine where they are, not numerically, but qualitatively. Maybe we can um, um, de describe uh, a detailed scale, um, qualitative scale, and let all countries try to enclose that scale in, in, in some, some uh, way. No? Um, the last topic. The assessment must be affordable for all countries. Um, not only affordable, but uh, sustainable, no? How to make it attractive to all governments? Can we have help of civilians? Um, in Mexico and I think in India and in other countries, there are uh, good um, uh, experience with uh, assessments developed by civilians um, and they afford some of the costs, they have the impulse, the, the political um, intention. And I think uh, we must think in, in a scheme, uh, uh, um, okay. a scheme that, that can consider them. Uh, I think in, in this uh, uh, topic with Baela and Jack, uh, because we all are um, concerned about the cost of new assessments. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very. Thank you very much, uh, Andres. And let's um, move quickly then to back to to Marguerite. Um, if you have any um, immediate points that you want to raise um, to the to the many new points that were introduced uh, by by our panelists, uh, and then I can uh, present a, a question or two for 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 Marguerite as well as for the panelists. Marguerite. 
Okay, thank you very much, Albert, and thanks to the discussants who, who raised a lot of very good additional issues. Um, I'll start with um, Bella's point about citizen-led assessments, which I think is really important and absolutely critical. Um, we know from from the research that's been done on citizen-led assessments that they are actually they're very good at raising awareness about learning, um, creating advocacy and action. And they've probably done a better job in that respect than some of the more so-called established um, national assessments. And they've really been critical to getting us to the stage where there is such a focus on learning in the SDGs. Um, I think moving forward, citizen-led assessments are, are critical as a way to measure learning among out-of-school children. Because even though the indicators under the SDGs reference children in school, the indicator is built around grades two and three, and to primary and to secondary, there are huge numbers of children still out of school. And I think we, we cannot ignore that, and I think we have to find a way to be able to reach out to households and places where out-of-school children are and, and bring them into to the mix. Um, so I think citizen-led assessments have a role to play there. And already they're informing some of the work that's been done under a piece for development in terms of finding ways to um, create sampling approaches that can identify 15-year-olds out-of-school so that their learning levels can, can be measured. Um, I, I think in terms of, of different assessments, um, as Andra said, different um, assessments can come at the constructs of reading and math in, in, in somewhat different ways. Um, I think that's very true, I think, but I think there's also some commonality. I think if you look at trends on national, regional, and international um, assessments, uh, say for a country like Chile, you, you do see that the trend line tends to be going the same direction. So even though Chile, for example, is below the international average on PISA, um, it's still um, been making steady progress over the last decade or so, and you see a similar upward trend line on its own national assessment. So even if there may be assessments that are at different levels of difficulty, I think there's value in trying to triangulate. I think you can actually use the differences as a strength, so you get a much better idea of how robust the increases in learning are to see if the learning is showing up on different kinds of tests of basically the same construct. So you know you're not just seeing scores go up as a result of teaching to the test. So I think there's ways to, to make that a strength rather than um, a weakness. Uh, and then in terms of what Jacques said about we need to ensure that, that all children are learning a minimum. Uh, this is absolutely critical. Um, if children don't learn minimum proficiency in reading and math, they're, they're just not going to survive in today's world. It's absolutely vital that we find ways to reach all children, uh, and not just those in school, and that's where citizen-led assessments also come in, but also I think we need to be more innovative in how we try to reach children and, and options for helping children learn. Children don't all learn in the same way. Um, so I think it's not just measuring kids, but also finding ways to work with them to help them learn what they need to to, to survive and thrive in, in today's world. Um, so Albert, I'll pass it back to you if you want to share any questions from the participants. Right. So, so we've reached the, the, the scheduled end of the webinar. Um, but it, but if you if you'll um, bear with us for for a few more minutes, we can we can introduce some of the questions, and um, we may not be able to to answer them comprehensively. But just to, just to notice uh, note some of these other things that that are uh, weren't weren't mentioned in such detail yet. Um, but first of all, I wanted to take one um, question here about the reaching agreement on a universal scale, and whether the regional assessments are going to be part of the solution in finding a global measure. Um, so this this question I think is is important, and I think is one where um, where we have the Global Alliance for Monitoring Learning that Marguerite mentioned it is that kind of platform for uh, regional assessments and others who are a member of the alliance then to be to be heard and to be part of that solution. And I think it's agreed all around that not only is it important to build on regional initiatives, but it's it's absolutely essential. And I think Marguerite touched upon that as a, as, as looking at, at these kinds of uh, opportunities as 
providing the real starting point for, for looking at um, comparing further across countries. Um, another issue which I think, Marguerite, you actually just covered some of the questions in your comments now about mm -hmm. trying to cover all of the children and this issue about, you know, that the, the testing is happening in schools but there's still children who are out of school and, and that, that, that are left out and that how can we talk about progress or uh, countries' progress when, when some of the population is excluded. But I think you, you touched upon that a little bit. One of the questions I think is interesting that I haven't heard so much about is how do we create political buy-in around conducting assessments? Uh, countries who might refuse to participate or who are um, reticent to, to join international assessments because of lack of contextualization in questions or they worry about what the data might say about their system. Marguerite, maybe if you could just uh, try, to, try to tackle that question about the, the political buy-in and the importance of, of this in, um, in, in trying to better monitor SCG4. Um, well, I actually, this might be one that um, Jacques and, and Bella might, might be better on, but, and, and Andres too, but um, I think what I've seen from uh, my work with countries at the, the World Bank is that depending on, on who you're talking to, particularly if you're, if you're talking to the, to the Ministry of Finance, that it's really important to be able to showcase the benefits of participating in these kind of assessments in terms of the kind of economic returns that they can help create in, in, in the country. And I, I think a lot of, of countries, once they realize that this is going to pay off long term, it's easier to, to decide to put your foot in the international assessment waters. And I think you can also point to other countries that have started out lower down on the scale in these assessments, but have used that information to improve. And I think Russia is an example that I would, I would bring up here and Brazil and Chile. If you, if you look at countries like uh, Brazil and, and Russia and China, well, I'll leave out China because China has been doing well the whole time, but Brazil and, and Russia have started, they started out and they weren't that high, but they have made steady improvement over time. And as members of the BRIC countries, you know, I think they show that it's okay to start out lower down the scale because you can use that information to improve. And, and I know we've done some case study work on Russia and you can see they, they use that information to their advantage. It's not so much where you're starting out, it's where you're headed. And it all depends on how you're going to use that information to improve. So I think getting people to get beyond the idea of where are we going to rank to how can we use this information to help improve learning levels, to help drive our economy, to help make us a more attractive country for investors. Okay, good. Thank you very much, Marguerite. And I'm afraid we've gone over time a little bit, but I just wanted to give some more, um, just to let you know that, that the session has been recorded and you'll be able to share it with, with colleagues. Um, I think we'll try to make sure that we keep posted the questions uh, that were also proposed. I think they're, they, they're, it's important as part of the, the, the full picture, so we appreciate your, your participation. Um, and just to, to remind everyone that uh, the next webinar on, on looking at uh, measuring child development um, with the presenter Abby Rakes from the University of Nebraska will take place this Thursday at the same time. So we hope you can you can join us then. Um, if you uh, aren't able to register, please contact uh, Olga Stjanovikova, whose name is uh, in the uh, materials. But I, I want just to just to finish again by thank you very much, Marguerite, for I think a really excellent um, overview of the challenges, and to all of our panelists who brought out I think some really important points as well. Um, this is a complex uh, issue um, and, and a very difficult one. Um, but certainly I think one where uh, there's an imperative to make progress, to, to move the scale, to, to, to move, uh, to advance the measurement agenda uh, now if we're really serious about um, making learning uh, something that's, that's uh, part of the monitoring the development goals. So I just wanted to thank everyone again. Um, thanks for joining the, the, the webinar and please, uh, please join in the future ones. Thank you.